to speak or to try and speak from this passage once before. And if anybody has a good memory, they might be able to tell me what it was I said. Uh, but if you don't remember, it's all it's important is if there was truth spoken and not what I said. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, and I will begin with verse 1, and then move over to verse 19. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing... And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of the tent, and the silver is under it. This first draw uh, caught my attention a while back in the connection between Achan and and Judah. If we go back to Genesis chapter 38, a most interesting chapter, it's like the scriptures are being told, or the, 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 the accounts are being told, and all of a sudden, a subchapter comes out. And uh, I remember being in a discussion one time, and the question was, why is chapter 38 there? It's such a bizarre setting. And the, and the setting is this. Judah is going on a trip, a business trip. And while he's out of town, and while he's out of sight and not around the familiar people, he goes and looking for a little action. And he finds the whore, the harlot, the willing participant, and he goes into her. He makes an arrangement with her. They conclude their business, and he goes on his way, only to find out later that this was his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and that she had purpose to do this because of a deal that he had welched on in which he said, Tamar, I'll give you my next son as a husband. And that came about because Judah's children, first heir and then Onan, were wicked, and God slew them. As a result of this encounter, there are two children born, Pharez and Zerah. And the descendant of Zarah is Achan, whose name means trouble. Interesting order of events that God should go back in time and see that God should order the events of Judah and his two sons in such a way that would lead to this encounter, that would produce this child, that would come to this event. And unless we think this is bizarre and strange and maybe an isolated incident, let us not forget how that God ordered the events that took place on the rooftop with David and Bathsheba that led to the murder of her husband the birth of the first child who died, the marriage between them two, that there should be brought forth one called Solomon, 
and one called Nathan, one being the type of the Christ that should come, the king of peace, the other one being the lineage of the house of David that should result in the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The objection that is, that is presented so often to those who try to rationalize the concept of predestination, they'll say God predestinated people, not events. How can you separate a person from an event? And if we go back, and not to be crude or to be country as they say in any way, the events that took place in the heart and mind of Judah that led him to the land in which he marries, a land that, whose name means nobility, in which he transacts his business and makes himself a wealthy individual, or should I say is made a wealthy individual, and has a son whose name means vigor and uh, wealth. And God says he was wicked, and he struck him down dead. And then he says to his next son, raise up seed. And that boy goes in, and he satisfies himself, but he spills the seed on the ground because he says, I'm not raising up a kid to my brother. I'm not uh, tainting my family or my inheritance. And God strikes him dead. These things that, that, these events that took place cannot be separated from the individual. What is the mindset of Onan that he should go into this woman, Tamar, that he should engage in sexual activity, and that at the end he should spill his seed on the ground? You cannot separate the heart, the mind, the action from the event. It's all, as we say, Part and parcel. And when we come to the event of Judah and Tamar, nothing else can be changed. Here's Judah. He's got the desire. He's got the mindset. I'm away from home. Take care of business. Nobody will know. But God had orchestrated this that, yes, there would be those that knew. Yes, this did come back. Yes, this did produce two children. And the son of one of those children should trouble all Israel. Now we go to the event in Joshua chapter 7. The hand of God had just been so majestly and magnificently displayed. Six days the children of Israel marched around the great city of Jericho. Six days they spoke not a word, but the priest blew the ram's, the ram's horn, the shofar. And on the seventh day they encompassed the city seven times. And on the seventh time the ram's horn, or the exaltation of the mighty one, that's what it means, was sounded, the people shouted, the walls came down, and they were to utterly destroy everything. But one individual had it placed in his heart to desire when we look to the scriptures about what sin is we're told that each man is drawn away by the lust and desires of his own flesh and when that lust hath conceived it brings forth sin. What did, he, what did Achan say? When I saw amongst the spoils, behold, I then coveted and I took. There's the lust, there's the conception, and there's the sin. What did he want? What did he see? He saw a goodly Babylonish garment. If we were to look at a map and see where Jericho was, strategically located right there on the other side of the Jordan River, we could very easily conclude 
that Jericho and Babylon weren't cousins, weren't neighbors, and weren't close whatsoever. But there was this garment that Achan saw. And it was not only a Babylonian garment, but it was a good one. He saw 50 shekels of silver, and he saw a wedge of gold that weighed 50 shekels. To look up these words in the original language, we see that the silver represents wealth. We see the gold represents brilliance or glory. And we see that the garment represents not only the idea of a covering in which he could hide, or should we call it from the scriptures a cloak of maliciousness, but we see that it has the connection to some confusion and subterfuge. There's deceit going on here. Babylon means confusion. So he was trying to have prominence and wealth all covered up under confusion in which he says as the wicked, no man sees what I'm doing. <clears throat> Joshua comes, verse 24, and Joshua says, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, burned them with fire, and after they had stoned them with stones, they raised up a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned the fierceness of his anger... Wherefore, the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day, the Valley of Trouble, or the Depths of Trouble, the Deepness of Trouble. Achan desired the things of this world for wealth, for prominence, and he did it deceitfully. And they raised up a heap of stones. We go through the scriptures, you're going to see that there are many times in which a pile of stones is put up. When the priests walked across the Jordan River, when their foot touched the water, it dried up, and the Jordan stood up on its end, and the children of Israel walked across on dry land, just as they, as they had done across the Red Sea. And the Lord said, Take twelve stones out of the midst of the river, and set it up as a memorial, a reminder. Pile the stones up as a reminder. This heap, this testimony, is a memorial, a reminder. And that's exactly what we have here. They piled a pile of stones. And anybody who wanted to know, they walked by, they say, what's that pile of stones there? If they're on the Jordan River, on the west side of the Jordan River, these things were done that when your children ask, you may tell them how the Lord delivered you this day across the Jordan River. When we go back to the children of Israel crossing over the, the Red Sea, he said, do these things, that when your children ask, you may tell them how the Lord delivered you out of Egypt. Now we come to the valley of Achor, the depth of trouble. And here's a pile of stones. It's a testimony. It's a testimony not only to the fact that Achan had troubled all of Israel. But it is a testimony to the ingredients that went in there. What's that pile of stones? Uh, some guy, they stoned him and burned him. No. No. When you compare what the scripture says about these testimonies, about these heaps, they're specific. Do these things that when your children ask, you may tell them, how the Lord delivered you out of Egypt. Dad, what's this pile of stones? Uh, well, uh, the family used to have a condo down in Egypt, but uh, we sold it and left. No. Tell how the Lord delivered you out of Egypt. How that he brought plagues upon the house of Egypt. How that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And how that he went into the house of the strong man and bound him and like the eagle, ripped his people out of that house. That's what he's saying. And how that when the glory of the Lord came to the Red Sea, he parted it, 
and showed his power and his might over the waves and over the seas and over the wind. And you walked over dry shod and the chariots of Pharaoh were drowned and you saw the bodies wash up on the shore. Tell these things about the power of God, about the salvation of God. And here's a heap. And here's a heap of a man who troubled all of Israel. And Joshua said, the Lord shall trouble you this day. So is it conceivable, consistent in the scriptures that we should just say, well, look, look at that pile of stones there. Guy must have got out of line and got stoned. No, the particulars are very important. I say all that because when we come to the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble, the depths of trouble, the question must be asked, what's that got to do with me? What's that got to do with the church? After all, aren't we walking the high road? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Haven't we gone to the point where we have victory over all these things? Where we are living the victorious Christian life? Where we have overcome all these things? Where everything is, what is it, gumdrops and lollipops? If it is, brethren, by the testimony of scriptures, I'm here to tell you, you're on the wrong road. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 65. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8, thus saith the Lord, As the wine, the new wine, is found in the cluster, and one saith, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it. My servants shall dwell there, and Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in for my people that have sought me. Scriptures make it very clear the house of the redeemed are the sheep of his pasture. And I can't find where this is anything different if he's saying, mine elect shall inherit it, my servant shall dwell there, my people that have sought me shall lie down. Where are we lying down if we're of the household, brethren? We're lying down in the valley of trouble. We're not lying down in the ease and the splendor of this world. If we go to the revelation of Jesus Christ, we look at those who lived deliciously and lived in splendor of this world, and they are standing right next to that beast, that Babylon, that great whore, as she is coming down. The children of the redeemed are not dwelling in the palaces here on this earth. We are dwelling in the valley of Achor, the valley of trouble. And lest we think that this is strange, go back to the 23rd Psalm where it says that he maketh me to lie down in a pasture. What pasture? Does it not tell us here that in the valley of Achor the herds lie down? Oh, you say, that's not, that's not Scripture. God hasn't prepared trouble for us, hasn't he? Brethren, unto you it is given not only to believe, but to suffer for the name of Christ. Is that rose petals and garnish? Or is that trouble? 
Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Where is the trying of your faith? Is it not in the valley of the shadow of death? Is it not in the valley of trouble? Look to Job. Where did Job get his patience from? Because he was a man of wealth and had all these kids and all these possessions? No, because the Lord sent forth Satan. His messenger took all that he had and touched his body to the point where Job was in such trouble. Read the accounts of Job. You're not going to find too much there that he says, Oh, my back hurts. Oh, these boils are killing me. Oh, my head hurts. He's not saying that. He is saying the hand of Almighty God has touched me to the quick, and he has brought me to the understanding that I am vile. My breath is corrupt. I am a song to my fellow people. They stand around and jeer at me. They point at me. They say, look, the hand of God is upon him. I know the hand of God is upon me, but it is teaching me that I am vile, and without him, I can't do anything. Where was Job dwelling? Where had Job lied down? He lied down in the valley of Achor, but he lied down because he had no strength. Look to Moses. Forty years in a wilderness. He wasn't dining at Pharaoh's table. Forty days and forty nights on the mountain. He wasn't up there at the cafe having an espresso with God. He had no food. He had no sustenance. But the Lord sustained him. Look at Elijah by that brook being fed with bread and water. Tell me where the strength is. The strength comes from the weakness. Like Paul said last week, 2 Corinthians 12, my strength is because I'm weak. Turn with me. Before we go, another point that I'd like to make here from Isaiah 65. Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the clusters, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is within, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. The Lord told a parable. He said, There was a good man that sowed good seed. And at night the wicked one came and sowed tares. And the angels came and said, Who did this? Master said, the wicked one has sown tares. And they said, ooh, let us tear them up. And he said, leave them alone, lest you destroy the wheat. You think that New Testament statement by Christ was something that he just made up? The new wine is in the cluster. But don't destroy it. Did he not say to the Pharisees, the kingdom is within you and in your midst, even on your lips? But it wasn't until he drew them out. It wasn't until he said, come ye out, my beloved, be not partaker of her sin. It wasn't until he had sealed his people in the forehead, like it says in Revelation. Then came the destruction. Then came the calamity. But he said, I found a treasure in a field. I went and I bought the whole field. I didn't tear it up. I let them dwell together. Just a thought that came to my mind. But turn with me, if you will, to Hosea. Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2, the Lord gives some instruction in verse 1. 
Say unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sister, Ruhama. If we look to the original language, this verse says, Say unto my people that have obtained mercy. Plead with your mother, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of my sight and her adulteries, for between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredom. Now here we have exactly what Isaiah was referring to. In the midst of one is another. Say unto my people whom I have had mercy upon, who have obtained mercy, say to your mother, you're not my wife. The separation between the true Israel of God and the national representation of Israel is very clear here. Here's my people who are called by my name, whom I have had mercy upon, and redeemed unto myself, saying to your mother, national Israel, you're not my wife. Go to verse 14. The long-suffering and patience of our God to bring forth his people, the new wine, out of the cluster. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence, from the wilderness. And the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the day of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. When God brought the nation of Israel out of the nation of Egypt, it was type, it was foreshadow. But as much as we look at it in type and foreshadow, we must also say that within the nation of Israel... There was a remnant according to grace. And he brought the one out with the other. But there was one upon whom his love was an everlasting love. And this is the one that he brought into the wilderness. And he spoke comfortably to. But in that speaking comfortably, he said, I will give her her vineyard. What do you get from the vineyard? The wine. The new wine. The new wine is the spirit, brethren. It's not the old wine. It's the new wine, and it is the spirit of God. I will give her her spirit, which is the spirit of God, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Does that make sense? Not to the flesh, it doesn't. I will give her the depths of trouble for a door of hope. You say, that sounds pretty bizarre. Huh? Turn back to Lamentations chapter 3. There's no new thing under the sun. Nothing is new. The moment you say this is something new, God says it's already been. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1, I am a man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Didn't Psalm 23 tell us that Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. But I am a man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness and not into light. Surely against me as he turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin has he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail, bitterness and travail. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He has hedged about me that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and I shout, he shuts out my prayer. I know. That is not a common occurrence, is it, brethren? Where you believe that the Lord has not even heard your prayer? 
He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He has made my path crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He had made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as the mark of his arrow. He hath caused his arrow, the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision unto all my people, and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness, made me drunken with wormwood. He hath broken my teeth with gravel stone, and hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. But remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for? Can there be any faith without being in the valley of Achor? In which the Lord reminds us by giving us the bitterness, by the understanding that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Brethren, we're not talking about the fact that I can't balance my checkbook. We're not talking about the fact that my biz, my livelihood is teetering on the fact of whether or not I maintain my job. We're not talking about the fact that I've got kids that are disobedient. And we're not talking about the fact that our economy's a mess or anything like that. We're talking about the fact that Paul said that there was a war going on in between me. And he said that I, when I would do good, I find that evil is present. We're not talking about social order. We're talking about the pains of death got hold of me. That sorrow and death are all around me. That when I would do good, when I would praise my God, when I would approach unto Him and pour out my heart unto Him, all I'm finding is that I'm a wretched, vile man. That's the valley of Achor. And how is it presented to us? By a Babylonian garment, by wealth, and by prestige. Oh, you only got one or two cars sitting out front there. If you was just to change your preaching a little bit, if you people would change what you believe and what you stand for, why, we could have this house filled. They'd be standing outside listening to it. We could pack them in. We'd put you on the TV. We'd prompt you up on the radio. And this plays to the flesh. My prayer is, brethren, that the Lord would speak truth in spite of the wickedness that I have and the corruption that I have in the flesh. And that if He has it for one of His children to hear, Praise be unto his name. And if it be for the speaker, praise be unto his name. But the allurement of taking this liberty wherewith we have been set free from the bondages that have been wrapped around us and using it as a cloak of maliciousness, using it for profit, Using it for gain is the goodly Babylonian garment that Achan saw. Look into the fact of being in the business of preaching the gospel, so-called gospel, for gain, for wealth, for prominence. Scriptures tell us that we have three categories of sin. We have the lust of the flesh lust of the eye and the pride of life. And it's no coincidence that there's three mentioned. And there's no coincidence that he can solve three things. And the testimony to the child of grace is that heap in the wilderness that reminds us that we are in a wilderness. We are not in our home. 
We are in an area where the water is bitter to us, where there is no meat to sustain us. Go back to the children of Israel. They were in a place in which the waters were marari. They were bitter. They couldn't drink them. They were in a place where there was no bread. They were in a place where there was no meat. Their provisions that they brought forth out of that strong man's house had long expired. Yet in that wilderness, God sent the rock, and he came and brought forth living water. And God set forth the what is it, which is the bread of life. And God set forth the quail, and he sustained them in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, where they had no conveniences, where they had no luxuries, where they had no provisions to sustain them, save from the hand of God, his flock lay down in the valley of trouble. You think there's a reason why it's called the wilderness of sin? Oh, that's not what it means, isn't it? Turn over with me to 2 Corinthians, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints are with all the saints which are in all of Achaia. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort of wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. To say that the valley of Achor is not where the flock is, then i got to ask you, why then do we need to be comforted? And the depths of the trouble are depicted right here when he says, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, which is major trouble, that we may comfort them that are in any kind of trouble. Now, if we weren't living in the valley of Achor, then we wouldn't have any trouble. And we wouldn't need any comfort. And Paul's not knowing what he's talking about. The Spirit must have given him wrong information. Think so? No. The flock has been caused to lie down in a pasture that has been made green and acceptable and profitable unto the flock, and it is in the valley of trouble. So that no flesh should glory in his sight. We are perplexed. Every day. This is why Paul said, I die daily, because daily I see the trouble that I'm in. But I have come to the understanding by the grace of God and the spirit that is within, that whatever state I am in, therein to be content. Can we understand the fact that he who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, who makes all things work together for good, has taken his children into the valley of trouble for their good. Paul didn't say that I found whatever state I'm in to be happy. Go ask Job whether he was happy. Go ask Paul and Silas when they had those fresh wounds on their back being locked fast in the stocks at midnight, whether they were happy, but they were content. They were content because the grace of God had been given unto them so that they knew whether in abundance or in need, therein to be content. So when we come to the question then, what can separate us 
from the love of God. If we're dwelling in the valley of Achor, if His hand has led us to lie down in the pasture of Achor, if the Assyrians of Isaiah chapter 5 are the rod of His and the staff which comfort us, what could separate us? We turn back to Romans chapter 8, and I'll finish up here. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Let's go to verse 30. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them also he called. And whom he called, them also he justified. And whom he justified, them also it doesn't say he will glorify. It says he glorified them. What shall we say to these things? If God before us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay any thing to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God and who makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? For as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Do you think there's anything to the fact that if we did not, if the household of faith did not endure such things, if they were not possible, because after all we're living the victorious Christian life, that he would write such things? No. The truth of the matter is that there is, or should I say, there are tribulations, distress, persecutions, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword which come upon the house of the Lord each and every day, or should we say all the day long. Why? Because we are dwelling, we are living, we are lying down in the valley of Achor. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is an everlasting love, which is the love whereby he draws us, and he leads us, and he has brought us into this wilderness, into this valley, this valley of trouble. It's not the doctrine you'll hear in today's society. It's not the happy-go-lucky, oh, how I love Jesus that you're going to hear. But the Lord has brought his children not into the city, not into the palace, not into the suburbs, but into the wilderness. And when we look to the Revelation... And when the woman brought forth the male child, where was she taken on the wings of eagle? To the wilderness. And the wilderness was happy for her. And the solitary place was glad for her. For her. And the wilderness blossomed and brought forth for her. It's not easy to sit and to look at the things or to experience the things that we go through and to acknowledge that this is for good because it sure don't feel good. And it's not easy to feel lonely and say, God, why have you left me alone? Where have you gone? I don't feel you. I don't feel anything. I, 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 I... Sometimes I feel that the struggle is so illogical, I question, 
do I believe anything? Is any of this real? Should I just chuck it aside and enjoy the party with the rest of the world? Eat, drink, and be merry. And if it was left up to the flesh, that's exactly what we would do. Because like the dog that returns to the vomit, we would go right back and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But God has taken us into this valley, into this wilderness, that we should have no confidence in the flesh, that we should not trust in our abilities, that we should not trust in the senses that have been given to us, the sight, to hear, to taste, that we should not find any confidence in the arm of the flesh or in another man. We are in a wilderness that we would know that without him we can do nothing. Where, did, where was Jonah when he learned salvation was of the Lord? He wasn't anywhere we'd want to be. Three days and three nights. We all remember the little cartoon Pinocchio. And there's Geppetto sitting inside the whale, and he's got a little fire going, and he's fishing, catching himself something to eat. Jonah was in the belly of a fish. There was no light. The Lord sustained him for three days and three nights. Do you think he was in the depths of trouble? And it was there that he learned salvation is of the Lord. May the Lord teach us such blessed truths and give us such hope. Let's pray. We are weak, Lord. And yet we constantly try to raise our hand and show what good there is in us. We pray that you would open our eyes and give us an understanding heart to your love for your people and the mercy that you have shown us and the inability there is in the hide of flesh that you have placed us in. Be thy will, Lord. Give us safe passage home. Be with our brethren. Comfort them. Teach them. We look forward to the time when, if it be your will, we can assemble again together. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.